Welcome to The Great Podcast, a show where we take a look at the important men and women of history and decide once and for all if they are worth all the fuss. And your name? I'm Jordan. Thank you. <laughs> you, got, you gave a weird look like you oh, missed I, something. Oh, no, oh. I smiled and nodded. That oh, was okay. maybe, maybe just, it was... It just looked like you peered a little closely. Like you, I was like... What do yeah. you? Do? I was just waiting for you to say your name. All right. Well, and I'm they David. Know who I am. Thank you for joining us uh, today. We have a very, very fun one for you, and I won't, I won't hold back. Let's just get started. Imagine, if you will, a battlefield strewn with bodies, the bodies of Roman soldiers, and only Roman soldiers. Mm-hmm. A small group mm-hmm. of legionaries emerges from the nearby city where the looting has already begun. The group rush toward a cluster of cavalrymen. They carry the banners of the Praetorians. At the center, the emperor sits astride his horse, blood trickling down the side of his head. We have found him, my emperor, one of the men announces. Bring him to me, the emperor replies. The legionaries share a look with one another. Um, It would seem he's uh, already dead, my lord. Suicide by the looks of it. The emperor casts his contemptuous glare at the man who spoke. I did not ask you if he was alive or dead. I commanded you to bring him to me. Do I make myself clear? All the legionaries break into a cold sweat before saluting and rushing off back into the city. The shouts of exhausted but triumphant men echo across the battlefield as the emperor and his guards wait. Soon, the group returns, hauling a corpse wrapped in a sheet. Blood seeps around the torso, suggesting the man stabbed himself in the guts. The body is placed before the emperor, who looks upon it with a mix of fury and satisfaction on his face. It is a troubling sight for all those around. Remove the head, the emperor says. Send it to Rome and inform the senate it should be put on display upon a spike. No one waits to question this. The leader of the legionary draws his dagger and removes the head as quickly as he can. Good, the emperor says from horseback. Now stand aside. The men obey and make room between their liege and the corpse. The emperor ushers his mount forward. The men watch in grim horror as their leader proceeds to trample the corpse over and over again. Some begin to fear that perhaps they had chosen the wrong side. And that's it. I don't know. They're not getting trampled by the horse. Maybe they chose the right side. You know, they did win. <laughs> <laughs> At survival. Least in that battle, the survival so. side. Yes. All right. Well, a quick recap for those uh, who don't recall. Last time we saw the aftermath of Commodus's assassination. Uh, Praetorian prefect Latus approached the experienced and respected general and senator Pertinax, and Pertinax agreed to take up the purple. He seemed to be the perfect man for the job. He was well-known by the legions, especially those along the Rhine. He was a beloved senator, and he was born to a freedman, which gave him credibility to the masses. Plus, he had a sick beard like Marcus and uh, Antoninus. Nice. That's number one right there. It is. I mean, Bacominus also had a sick beard, so maybe it's not the best judge of character. Unfortunately, the corruption in the government, and more importantly, in the guard, uh, cost Pertinax everything. Within three months of trying to make reforms and save the sinking empire, several hundred guardsmen took it upon themselves to pay their liege a visit. Pertinax delivered a damn good speech that was starting to work when Chad threw his favorite Ah, spear. that's right. A spear appeared in his chest. Yep, and uh, you'd be shocked to know that he died. (laughs) After realizing they were all in, the guards decided to sell the empire to the highest bidder. Didius Julianus stepped forth and offered each guard 25,000 sesterces, and he won. It's a lot. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money, and he probably couldn't pay it off, I think we decided last time. But he didn't need to. Uh, The people were so appalled at this disgusting display that they sent messages out to several of the leading generals to come and liberate them from this tyrant. Funny how no one dared to do this to stop Commodus. Mm -hmm. Uh, But by day two of Julianus being in charge, they'd had enough. (laughs) I will leave the recap there for now, as we are going to catch up with the life of one of the men who received these letters from the people. Today, we will look at Septimius Severus. Nice. Great name. Ancestor of Severus Snape, obviously. Correct. Yes, same, (laughs) for sure. So, Lucius Septimius Severus was born April 11th, 145 CE. This is several years into Antoninus Pius's 23 years of peaceful rule. He was born in Leptis Magna, that is in modern-day Libya, in the province of Africa. Okay. 
Uh, his father was Publius Septimius Geta, and his mother was Fulvia Pia. Okay. Yeah. Don't really need to remember those. I'm just their names just aren't as cool. They are not. No, right. they aren't. Yeah. Um, the people of this province where he grew up had been granted Roman citizenship under Trajan. This opened the door for Severus's already successful family to begin entering the senatorial class. Uh, his father, Geta, uh, did not hold any official office, but several of his uncles were consuls by the time Severus was growing up, though many in the family were still of the equestrian rank. He had to kind of climb that ladder to get right. into the next rung. As he was lower born, we know little about his early life and education. Just isn't written down. Uh, but Dio tells us that he was very interested in education. Uh, he received less of it than he had wished, though. He was very interested in getting a higher education, but he just didn't get it in his youth. <laughs> but he was learning things as he grew up, including oratory. He, we know he delivered his first speech at the age of 17, which is an important uh, step for a political figure. He was also known to have a bit of a temper. Smart and fun to be around, but get on his bad side and get ready for a tongue lashing. Love that. Yeah. By 162 CE, uh, Severus traveled to Rome to begin his government career. However, it all hinged on one of his relatives convincing Emperor Marcus Aurelius to admit the equestrian teenager into the mm. senatorial class, which Marcus did. Perfect. Yep. So Severus was now Ready to start senatorial. The climb. Yep. Up the cursus honorum he goes. He did the basic jobs young men did. He oversaw the maintenance of roads and public works. He served as a type of state attorney under Marcus. He avoided being a military tribune for some reason that we don't really know. Apparently, you can skip rungs. You just have to wait until you're old enough to do the next oh. thing. Interesting. So this set him back a little bit, and he didn't really have anything to do until he was 25 and could start his quaestorship. During this time, the Historia Augusta tells us of some omens that Severus saw, which told him that he would one day become emperor. Might be right. Well, are you ready for the foretellings? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. All right. So he, one day, saw an innkeeper, mm -hmm. get this, reading Hadrian's biography. Why would he do that? Well, I, that's irrelevant, but <laughs> obviously this means that Severus is going to become emperor. That's what I'm saying. I was like, why would he be reading that unless, unless it meant that yeah. Severus was going to yeah. be emperor? This is such a good omen. Cool. You want to hear facts. another? Yeah. While invited to a banquet by Marcus Aurelius, he wore some Greek clothing that wasn't quite a fit for this type of occasion. Severus did. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for clarifying. So Marcus let Severus wear one of his imperial robes. There you go. Clearly this meant that he was going to be omen. emperor. Marcus just gave a seal of approval. That's right. I he said, you're wearing the wrong clothes. Wear this instead. Yeah, it couldn't possibly be emperor. that Marcus was a kind man. No. Who helped out an not. inexperienced <laughs> young senator. No, 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 no. no. Definitely. Oh, uh, and that night he had a dream about sucking on some wolf titties. Kind of like Romulus and Remus. Like a furry? What are we talking about? Well, here? I was going to say, it was, either, it was either in reference to Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, or right. he's just secretly a zoophile and couldn't accept that That's about true. himself. Well, yeah, maybe he shouldn't. What a dream. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Sucking on some wolf titties. That means I'm going to be an emperor. Uh, obviously, going to huh. be emperor. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all those omens are the reason why we rarely rely upon the Historia Augusta. Well, I don't know. They seem to be right we'll find out i guess this we we are i'll remind you we're going to be talking about the year of the five emperors so. that's right yeah all was going yell yell all yell. was going well for the young man uh he was climbing the political ladder at a steady rate and having grand delusions about where his hard work, work could take him but then in 166 ce the antonine plague arrived in the capital that's right Seeing literally thousands of people succumb to this strange illness in rapid succession and having little to do for the time being, Severus decided to head back to his home in Africa. Wait all this foulness out, perhaps. Seems but, fair. Uh, little did they know that this plague is going to last for <laughs> a, a long, long time. time. Yeah. The Historia Augusta mentions that he was charged with adultery at this time. Apparently, the case was dismissed. Uh... Who knows if it happened? I thought I'd share. Yeah, I guess, yeah. A few years later, he returned to Rome at age 25 to assume his Perfect quaest timing. quaestorship. Yes. Man, can't talk today. This is when he moved from senatorial class to official Roman senator. He was of the class, but now he is in the Senate. Made it. reached that point. And then we know little of the following decade of his career. 
It's probably pretty boring, huh? Yeah, he held many posts during this time. Uh, the plague had killed so many people yeah. that there were just job openings. Uh-huh. Plenty of them. Yeah, I'm sure it was just busy. Kind of like after the Black Death, there was a lot of civil bet. change yeah. <laughs> because we, uh, we need people. Yeah. Had the plague not hit, Severus likely would have taken much longer to climb the rungs of the Curse's Honorum. But, you know, you take what opportunities you can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Around 170 CE, his father died suddenly. Severus rushed back to Africa for the funeral. By 173 CE, Severus's cousin, another Severus, was made <laughs> proconsul of Africa. This would be the governor. As is often the case, family came first, and the younger Severus was appointed to a senior military position. Mm. Potentially his first. Yeah, no, I'm right, not positive he on that. Skipped that rung potentially. Mm-hmm. Next, he returned to Rome once again to assume the role of tribune of the plebs in the Senate, and apparently this was at the recommendation of Marcus himself. Wow! So he's making high honor, building a name for himself That's with right. the, one of the best emperors Rome has ever seen. Sometime around 175 CE, Severus was in his 30s and thinking about settling down a bit. He met a woman named Marciana, likely during his time serving as legate in Africa. Soon, the two were married, uh, and that is almost all we know about her. The two were married for around a decade. Most accounts confirm that they had no children. The Historia Augusta really likes to mention that they had two daughters, but historically, we have <laughs> no record of them. No, 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 no. There's so, two kids. No, 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 no. Yeah. had two daughters, for sure. Either way, in 186 CE, Marciana died. I read that Dang. it was natural causes, but what does that mean back in those days? Because she was probably really. in her 30s. Yeah. She apparently was not mentioned in his autobiography, Severus's autobiography, but he did build lots of statues of her later in life. Interesting. Whether or not Severus had children with Marciana, they didn't live long enough to make an impact, but he found himself in his early 40s, a widower and childless, or at least heirless. Great place to be. Right. He wasted no time in seeking out a new wife, and so he turned to horoscope, horo, bleh, horoscopes <laughs> to divine his future. After playing a game of ancient horoscope Tinder, he swiped right on a woman named Julia Domna. The soothsayer told him this beautiful young woman was destined to marry a king. So logically, it followed that right. in Severus's mind, her, if he married her, right. he would be the king. That's right. Or emperor. You right. Know. Well, you words, know, semantics. We, 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 don't, we don't have kings here. We don't That's do right. that here. <laughs> Julia Domna was born in Emesa, Syria, around 160 CE, so about 15 years younger than Severus. Damna means black in ancient Arabic, according to Wikipedia. Uh, her fair, uh, family were Arab descendants from the Emesan dynasty, a small mm. client kingdom of Rome, who were led by priest kings back in the day, and they worshipped the sun god Elagabalus, sometimes called Elagabal, El- El- Elagabal, Elagabal, Elagabal. There we go. That's right. The meaning of the name Damna goes deeper as a black stone was the central piece of the worship of Elagabalus. Ah, so very she's basically high name. named for yep, mm-hmm. very important name. I share this with you because it becomes important in future episodes. Oh boy. Julia is a very interesting person and she stays important for a while. I'm glad you're going to remind me of that again later. Oh, I will. Yeah. <laughs> Julia Domna's family were very wealthy and important in Syria. Uh, through their ties to the priest kings of the past, the family were of sen- the senatorial aristocracy. Remember, Hadrian had encouraged leading members of the provinces to join the Senate. Mm-hmm. Notably, Julia Domna also had a sister, Julia Mesa. Oh. The name Mesa is less about religion and more about walking with a swinging gait. Wow. Again, according to Wikipedia. So keep her in mind as well. Walking with us. Yep. We saw her. She's a toddler. She just flopped around everywhere. So we decided to call her Mesa. Yep. (laughs) So she doesn't come into the story anymore today, but she does come in later. In 187 CE, Julia Domna and her father, Bassianus, traveled to Gaul, where Severus was serving as governor, Mm. climbing those rungs still. They married in Lungdunum modern Lyon, France. Though this was a marriage for the sake of having children, the two soon found great joy in one another. Severus adored his his inquisitive wife. Julia Domna was a great lover of learning and enjoyed nothing more than reading, writing, and discussing matters of state and philosophy. Quite strange for a woman of this time. That's right. They can't be smart. Right. What is that? Honestly, you know, we say uh, the important men and women of history in our intro. Right. Rome is just really all men. Yeah. So... (laughs) Julia Domna is one of the few that we could, if she wasn't surrounded by far more important and interesting men, we could do an episode on her because she's really interesting too. Very fascinating. She surrounded herself with knowledgeable people her whole life. 
So, uh, in, oh yeah, so they got on very well. They liked each other a lot. So well, in fact, that within a year they had their first son, Lucius Septimius Bassianus, and the next year another son. Nice. Publius Septimius oh, Geta. Publius, why? Publius. You just... Publius! Man, it's not a great one. Yeah. Severus continued in his steady career and happy family life over the next few years. He had built a solid reputation as a diligent man in whatever role he was assigned. He was maybe not beloved by the people beneath him, but they knew that he got the job done despite his strictness mm-hmm. and short temper. Interestingly, Severus in Latin means stern or grave, well, which is that kind of fitting. Yeah. Also fits for Severus Snape. It does. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Perhaps people didn't really enjoy him, but his temper and intellect were enough to carry him through. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to be a grumpy guy. In 190 CE, Praetorian Prefect Latus recommended Severus to Commodus for the governorship of Pannonia Superior. So another governorship. The following year, shortly after New Year's Day, a letter arrived. Commodus was dead. <gasps> the Senate and the guards had proclaimed Pertinax as emperor. Several took this news, or Severus took this news quite well. <laughs> he was no idiot. He saw the damage Commodus and his cronies had done over the last 12 years, and Pertinax would be a great replacement. The two had certainly interacted throughout their mm-hmm, careers, mm-hmm. and everyone loved Pertinax. So Dang. imagine Severus's shock when, yeah. <laughs> three months later, another letter arrives. Hey, yo, Pertinax is dead, too. Uh. <laughs> Please come save us, was the letter, because this letter was from the people of Rome. Oh. Day one of Didius Julianus, remember, they sent out letters to several leading generals. That's right. Saying, please save us. The despicable, worthless man who claimed he had bought the empire from the guards and probably helped in the murder of Pertinax was Didius Julianus. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, seeing the danger this coup could pose, Severus quickly and quietly sent word back to Rome. Julia Domna was to get herself and their two young sons out of the city now. That's right. Somewhere safe. Commodus had made a practice of holding the children of governors hostage oh. to ensure loyalty. Julianus seemed the type to do the same. Is that really loyalty? I don't well, know. Well, you know, <laughs> obedience. Think blackmail is <laughs> yeah. loyalty. I don't know. <laughs> right. No, you're, you're correct. <laughs> Severus was outraged by what was going on. He had he was known to have a bit of a temper, as we discussed. And Com- But Commodus's death had made sense. He was clearly off his rocker, but uh, Pertinax had been setting things right. He had been slaughtered in the palace for the greed of the guards and this man, Julianus. And this could not go unanswered. However, the information Severus received also told him the people were most interested in another man becoming their emperor. Do you remember who it was? Nope. All right. (laughs) Pacinius Niger. Okay, yeah, that's familiar. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, he was the governor of Syria at the time and highly experienced general from the Marcomannic Wars yeah, under yeah, Marcus yeah. Aurelius. But Severus was way closer to Rome, because Syria is very far away. Pannonia mm-hmm. Inferior or Superior, I can't remember which one, is directly northeast nice. of Italy, just right there. Let's go hops and skip. His legion, Severus's legion, proclaimed him emperor with the hope in their hearts that he could bring stability to the madness which had gone on in the capital for so long. Mm. Soon, a few other nearby legions joined them as well. I think I, I think I, I have a prediction of what's your intro, who the people are now. Oh, we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. Yeah. I'll, if you guess it right, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you a pat on the back. <laughs> Thanks, bro. There was also the problem of Albinus or Albinus, but I like calling him Albinus. Mm-hmm. Albinus was the governor of Britannia. Mm-hmm. He was also in command of a large military force and thought he'd look great in purple. Right. Plus, the people had sent word to him as well, as so do. clearly they wanted him to come down yeah. to save the day. Albinus and Severus were both not fools, however. They knew that if they clashed before Niger arrived from the east, Niger the victor... Just, yeah. Yeah. Steamroll. Mm-hmm, you're done. Mm-hmm. Niger wins. It was a lose-lose if they engaged. So, Severus sent word to Britain. It said, paraphrasing here, I'm going to go to Rome and become emperor. As the soldiers have declared for me already... I hereby declare you, Albinus, my Caesar. Mm. Stay out of the fighting until everything is settled. Then you can come down to the capital, XOXO Severus. Right. Seeing as Severus was in the best position and Albinus would be too slow to beat him to Rome, Albinus he was like, All right. accepted these cool. terms. Likely planning a double cross, Right. but who knows. For now, Severus need only worry about Niger and whatever Julianus could throw mm-hmm. at him. As it turned out, 
Julianus had nothing to throw yeah. against him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Severus moved quickly into Italy, making it impossible for Julianus to prevent his progress. Mm -hmm. He soon took Ravenna, which is one of the most important cities in Italy, without a fight. They opened the doors for him. Senators and priests arrived every couple of days. Uh, They were on orders to convince Severus to turn back. Give up this folly. This isn't going to work. Yeah, but instead of following the orders, they're probably just like, hey, we're going to chill with you. Uh, yeah, instead, they all just came to his side. there, yeah. And they're like, so uh, <laughs> maybe not exactly happily came over, but right. they saw the writing on the wall. Yeah, they're like, huh, it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Now, they were probably pretty scared about Severus, what Severus was intending to do, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, an army marching on Rome. Never a good thing. But none were more afraid than Julianus himself. He was busy trying to train worker elephants to stand against legions. That's right. Yeah, this guy. Cassius Dio and the other senators, meanwhile, were laughing at him behind his back. Within weeks of Julianus becoming emperor, it was clear he could not hold on to what he had bought. Mm -hmm. Severus had one final ploy that he sent into the city, and it was going to ruin the hope of Julianus fighting it all. Severus promised the Praetorian guards that if they turned over the murderers of Pertinax and kept order in the city when he arrived, all would be forgiven. Yeah, that's what they're looking for. This was an amazing offer, Mm -hmm. especially to these disgruntled and fearful guardsmen who were being asked to to fight to stand up against severus yeah yeah with, to straight with up what? fight this army of experienced soldiers that are no. real upset with us yeah <laughs> like this is personal at this point they could now see the error of their ways mm-hmm. but far too late their choices were as i said fight several of the best legions and certainly lose or give up chad and his goons it was an it's easy okay. decision it's okay yeah. you can give up chad yeah as severus marched south through italy another procession of senators greeted him this one was much larger than the others sent to dissuade him. The last one that came through had offered to share the empire between Julianus <laughs> and Severus, to which Severus had replied, I'd rather be your enemy than your friend. Yeah. <laughs> this new group was even larger, though. They looked like damn near half the senators of Rome had come out. They brought with them news that they had declared for him, and in that action, sentenced Julianus to death. In fact, one said look, while well, looking at his wrist as if he had a watch, Julianus should be begging for his life at this very moment. And so it was that Severus became a conquering general emperor without having to fight a single battle. Pretty impressive. Just kind of showing up. Look at me. It's not going to (laughs) happen. I win. Stop asking questions. Severus continued toward the city. He was still cautious and kept his most loyal men close at all times. And they all wore their armor 24-7 on this march. Wow. Julianus had sent several assassins already, and there could be more on the payroll, despite him already being dead. He, yeah, well, he's dead, though. Well, I guess they, maybe they don't know that. Maybe they don't know. They've been hiding in a tree for three weeks. No <laughs> cell phones. No, no cell phones. <laughs> That's right. No email. It's ridiculous. <laughs> About a day's march away from the capital, Severus sent word to the Praetorians. He wished to hold a proper ceremony as he entered the city. The emperor's personal guard should usher him in. It was only proper. At Severus's command, the guards left their armor and swords in their camp within the city. This would be a congregation similar to when the emperor went to perform a sacrifice. The guards would be dressed in formal toga-type garments. Several thousand of them marched out of the city in ceremonial formation to meet their liege and bring him into the capital. Okay. Those who had helped kill Pertinax remained under lock and key back Mm -hmm. in the camp. Mm -hmm. The rest were assured that they were about to receive their admittance into Severus's guard. As they entered Severus's camp, they saw their emperor sitting on a low platform at the center. He commanded they form up before him, and it was clear he wished to give them a proper speech. Yeah. The men cheered as they formed up. Finally, some de- stability was at hand. Yeah. Plus, Severus's soldiers weren't going to slaughter them in the streets of Rome. No, they're oh. going to slaughter you outside of Rome. Well, who knows? <laughs> you know, it's right now things are going great. It feels ominous. <laughs> The guards were so caught up in the moment that they barely noticed that Severus raised his hand. (laughs) As they did see him, quiet fell across the gathered men. It was only then that the Praetorians saw what had happened. (laughs) Severus's signal had not meant for them to be quiet. (laughs) The regular soldiers had subtly encircled the guards as they formed up. Now they found themselves mostly unarmed and ringed in by superior numbers of heavily armed, highly trained soldiers. Uh Uh-huh. It was at this time that Severus gave that speech everyone was waiting for. Yay. And now you die. Here's some snippets of that speech we get from Herodian. Again, probably not what actually was said, but 
Mm-hmm. Herodian is so good. That's right. He's going to capture the essence. Oh, he is. You now see a practical demonstration of the fact that we are your superiors in intelligence, in the strength of our forces, and in the number of our allies. You have been easily trapped and are our prisoners without even a struggle. I love how he just rubs it in. Yep. Like, you're dumb like and helpless. Idiots. You just walked Stupid. right out of here. You murdered a respected and honorable emperor when you ought to have been acting as a guard for his protection. Our ancestors won the Roman Empire by deeds of outstanding bravery, but you sold it shamefully and dishonorably for a sum of money, as though it were some private possession. Then he calls them cowards Mm -hmm. for giving up and coming to his side rather than fighting and defending (laughs) their benefactor like men. For these enormities and crimes, you deserve to die a thousand times (laughs) if one were to to determine a just punishment. And what do you think he did next? I wanted to just kill them all because that'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, he said, but I'm not going to do that. He did decide <laughs> to spare them. <laughs> Your lives and limbs shall be spared. Take them as a gift of my generosity. The men were stripped of all rank and titles mm-hmm. and clothing. Oh. They were then banished, never to come within 100 miles of Rome again. Oof. The whole empire? Just just Rome. The, the city? city? Okay, yep. so they can still exist within the Correct. <laughs> boundaries yeah. of Rome. And then they were sent packing, stripped naked. It's like, all right. Very roughly. Goodbye. Yep. <laughs> Meanwhile, a small detachment had snuck into Rome of uh, mm-hmm. Severus's soldiers and occupied the Praetorian camp. This to prevent the disbanded guardsmen from returning and rearming themselves. Right. Pertinax had warned the guards, if you recall, that killing him would lead to bad juju, essentially. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he was correct. Yep, sure did. Severus then filled the ranks of the Praetorians with his own elite troops. Not since the days of Augustus was the guard comprised of such experienced and dedicated men. Hopefully now there would be significantly less king-making from the Praetorians. Right. A few days later, Severus walked into Rome. I'll let Dio describe the scene because he was there. Severus entered Rome. He went as far as the gates on horseback and in cavalry attire, but from that point on changed to citizen's garb and walked. The entire army, both infantry and cavalry, in full armor, accompanied him. The spectacle proved the most brilliant of all that I have witnessed, for the whole city had been decked with wreaths of blossoms and laurel, and besides being adorned with richly colored stuffs, blazed with lights and burning incense. So it was a pretty big thing where they're probably going... We, we love you. Please don't murder us yeah, all. Right. We love you so much. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Yay. <laughs> oh, the city was horribly on edge. Uh, would Severus bring fire and steal down upon them? Or would he finally put an end to all this chaos that had been going on for half a year at this point, plus the 12 years of Commodus? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it seems like he's probably going to end the chaos. Yeah. Or try to. That's the goal. Severus <laughs> made his way to the Temple of Jupiter to do some proper sacrificing. Then he did the usual circuit of temples to make sure all the animals were slaughtered and the various gods were happy. The following day, he went down to the Senate chambers and met with them. There, he announced that he had marched all this way to avenge their beloved Pertinax. Hmm. And as he was the man with the army, he was also the man to replace Pertinax. Correct. Divine honors were hastily granted to the late emperor, and Severus had already added Pertinax to his list of names. Uh, The Senate confirmed this, of course, just to make it more official. Dio says, a gold image of Pertinax was ordered brought into the Hippodrome on a cart drawn by elephants and three gilded thrones for him conveyed into the remaining theaters. So that's nice. Mm -hmm. Dio then goes on to, in detail, that I stopped reading, (laughs) the lavish (laughs) funeral that Severus put on for Pertinax. It was long. It was a good funeral. We get it. It was good. Moving on. It's great. Severus also promised that the craziness of Commodus and Julianus was at an end. No more executions without trial. No more corruption and mistreatment of the people. Everything would be on the up and up moving forward. Dio says that this was not idle talk either. Severus had these provisions ratified in law. Hmm. It's good. Yeah. And then Dio goes on to say, yet he was himself the first to break the law. (laughs) And instead of keeping it, caused the death of many persons. Well... Many were not happy with having an occupying general as their emperor, particularly since his legions were made up mainly of those from the provinces, and he was from the provinces too. That's right. Almost barbarians to the eyes of many in the city. 
Dio points out that he should have put his trust in the Senate and the people rather than hiding behind his soldiers. Although he is a conquering general. So, yeah, I don't know, man. They also weren't happy that the Praetorians were now open to any soldiers whom the emperor deemed fit. Previously, they had only been pulled from Italy, Spain, Macedonia, and Noricum, more proper places. That's right. These good proper men. Yeah. None the these, ones who... None of these province people. Yeah. These good proper men who just keep seeming to kill the people they're in yeah, charge right? of protecting. Yeah, right? just, like, power grubbing. It's wild. But we're racist, so we're not going to let people from the provinces join. That's right. Until Severus comes along and says, hmm. Severus responded to this criticism that... They were perfectly capable soldiers. There were mm-hmm. perfectly capable soldiers all across the empire. Why waste their talents and allow the spoiled brats of Italy to ruin the guard with their entitlement? Got him. Yeah, he did. <laughs> and they're like, okay, we're sorry. <laughs> Needless to say, Severus' as emperor was a mixed bag for everyone. He was a strong, intelligent man with the backing of many legions. He was also very strict and quick to violence when threatened or insulted. Fortunately for those in the city, they did not need to deal with him for long. Pisinius Niger was still out in the east calling himself emperor, mm. and that could not stand. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough claim when you're not in Rome. Right, <laughs> but when you do have the most populous and powerful provinces under you. Yeah, and a lot of armies, know? I know, who were just like, hey man, just let it go. Just let it go, give up, Severus already made it, to- Severus yeah. got to Rome. Let's just not, you know, we don't need to see a civil, civil war. war. Civil war. Civil war. <laughs> All right. So Severus's newly appointed urban prefect and longtime friend, Plautianus, whose name we'll come into more later, was instructed to find Niger's children in the city and essentially kidnap them. The thing he, Severus, avoided earlier <laughs> with his own children. I mean, hey, he knows it's a good tactic. <laughs> it sure is. The children were brought to the palace. And they were treated as Severus's own sons were treated. Oh, okay. Well, you know, but always that looming threat that if their sure, father like, pushed too far... You might yeah. stop breathing. I don't yeah, know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, once that was handled, legions were dispersed. Troops were sent to Africa to prevent an invasion from Egypt. Egypt had declared for Niger with most of the eastern provinces. A sign was hung over the gates of Alexandria, which read, Welcome, Lord Niger. Oh, not a well, great sign when no. that's the breadbasket of the empire. Nope. A legion was also sent forth to take Greece and Thrace, which is right above mm-hmm. Greece, while Severus lingered back to assemble more troops. This legion was almost quick enough to take all of their assigned territory. However, Niger had beaten them to Byzantium. This is the first time we've really discussed this highly important historical city. It is the crossing point between Greece and Anatolia. And Byzantium is the city which will one day become Constantinople. Ooh, very important. And then Istanbul. Yeah. Yes, that is where we are now. And Byz- the and Byzantium had walls, mm-hmm. big ones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Its placement on the sea coast and rough terrain made it an ideal position to defend. Now, for those who know a bit about uh, Byzantine history, these are not the Theodosian walls, the really, really big walls that were so big that no one conquered <laughs> Constantinople forever. These were just some big walls. That's right. These are the walls before those walls. Correct. Niger was also trying to drum up support, notably by reaching out to the Parthians Mm. for an alliance. What do you think the Parthian king said? No. No, thanks. (laughs) Uh, If Severus went on the offensive, Parthia was not in a position to stop him. He's like, eh. Mm. No, thank you. We're just going to stay a, uh, what is it called? A client state. Were they a client state? No. Parthia no. is an empire. Oh. You're thinking of Armenia. Yeah. Yep. But Parthia's just like, that's okay. Nope. We don't need that. Nope. You, you, guys, you guys do your civil warring. We'll be over here <laughs> We're just, just chill. existing. Right. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so Niger got the assistance of a few smaller eastern states and prepared for Severus's arrival. Despite this advantage, Niger's forces were defeated several times over the next two years. In 193 CE, the Battle of Sisius... I think, and Nicaea saw solid victories for Severus. The battered Nigerian legions, which is, I don't know what else to call them, so I want Nigerian. (laughs) (laughs) Now now what you thinking? Not not the country, the the man. The legions of Niger. (laughs) So the legions of Niger fell back to defensive positions in the Taurus Mountain Passes. So uh, Severus was furious that Mm -hmm. the enemy had managed to retreat because now the war was going to carry on. Right. For this, he replaced the commanding officer with a new man. Now, Severus rarely led from the front at this point. He might have been suffering from early stages of gout, but it's unclear. 
Got them sore feet. That yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that said, he was certainly leading from the rear. Yeah. He was coordinating this war for sure. Severus was also playing psychological warfare on the governors of the eastern provinces. Like Niger, their children were being held captive back in Rome, and he made it known just what would happen if they didn't play ball. Ah, good. Soon, cities and various legions were swapping sides. People were, you know, going, "Oh, maybe we just declare for Severus now," mm -hmm, and then fighting mm -hmm. would break out, which is kind of exactly what Severus wanted to happen. These small revolts were disrupting supply lines and intelligence for Niger and his legions. Then, in May of 194 CE, a storm began to brew in the sky, and on the fields around Isis, two armies faced off. Hmm. Severan troops launched an assault on Niger's main force, and here is how Herodian described the moment. With fierce energy, they fell upon each other, as though this was the contest to end all battles, and fate was then and there, making its choice of emperors. God, I love Herodian. Wild. So good. Wind picked up as arrows and javelins flew through the air. The men formed up in testudo formation, covering their entire formation with their shields as they advanced. The fighting was tough and vicious. With the rain picking up and the winds whipping the water into the faces of Niger's men, they didn't notice the cavalry circling around behind huh. them. Once the hammer crashed into the anvil, the battle was all but over. Niger fled to Antioch, where he was soon captured. He was beheaded, and according to Historia Augusta, Severus carried the head around on a spike. Ah. The next couple of years, Severus moved about the east, reasserting his power and punishing those who rose against him. Pleasantly enough, he sent Niger's wife and children into exile rather than murdering them. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so that's nice. Yeah. Again, the Historia Augusta here, a quote, He took savage rep reprisals against many who had followed Niger. He put to death those senators who had served in Niger's army with the rank of general or tribune. <laughs> so there goes that no uh, executing senators thing. <laughs> For this wonderful victory, well, Severus was offered a triumph. He was also offered several new titles, including Parthicus. Okay. Which would mean that he um, conquered Parthia. Yeah. This because he had um, beaten up several Parthian client kings in his campaigns of <laughs> reprisal. Okay, well. Because after he had won, he was like, oh, you guys sided with Niger? Well, I'm going to come invade your home. That's right. Time to beat you up. Time to, time to turn you guys into a new province. He rejected both the triumph and the title. However, oh. the triumph seemed in bad taste. This was a, a civil, civil war. war. Yeah. You don't want to celebrate winning a civil war. As for Parthicus, he did not wish to upset the Parthian Empire because he was kind of busy at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> All very I sensible. Don't need another war. That's right. fine. Yeah, exactly. Meanwhile, Byzantium held out against the siege until 196 CE. This is almost two years later. Jeez. Probably hoping someone would rise up and carry on the war in Niger's absence. Why? While the, huh? Wild. Just, yeah. just thinking about like. It's a civil war. You're just killing your own people. Yeah. Why do you want it to continue? <laughs> right. Well, I think they were worried that if they opened the doors, they were going to die just anyway. Die. Yeah, yep, because they had annoyed Severus. While this siege dragged on, Severus continued his cleanup of the client states and various barbarian groups in the east. When the city finally did fall, Severus set upon it with a vengeance. Mm. The walls were torn down, and most of the city was razed to the ground. Well... Well, maybe if they would have gave up sooner, it wouldn't have happened like maybe. that. <laughs> like several other major cities who stood for Niger, Byzantium's status as a metropolis was reduced. I bet, yeah. This put them under the government umbrella of a neighboring city in the province, which was a big hit to a lot of people's ego about mm -hmm. their city. Severus was not playing around. By this time, the only man with enough power to stand up to Severus was... Albinus. His own Caesar. That's right. Yep. So Claudius Albinus. Again, no fool. He was an experienced military man under Marcus, as most were at this time. Aside from Severus. Yeah. He was kind of too young to yeah, really, he didn't be, really do the military he, stuff you know, for him. Now, Albinus knew that his position was tenuous. Mm -hmm. While Severus had been fighting in the east for nearly three years, Albinus had been de facto in charge of the west, maybe? Kind of unclear how much power oh. he actually had at this time. He was at least in charge of Britain, probably Gaul and Spain as well. Mm -hmm. He knew that once Severus was back in Rome, his power would diminish greatly. While Severus was still in the east, Severus began getting reports that some powerful people had been privately corresponding with Albinus. How dare you? It would seem there were a handful in the Senate who would prefer Albinus 
as emperor. Should probably kill them without a trial. Well, whether these rumors were true or not, Severus <laughs> likely never planned on keeping Albinus as his heir. Right. That had been a clever ploy. Because right, he had two sons. Yes. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So. Two young sons, too. Yeah. So that clever ploy was at its end now that he had handled Didius, mm-hmm. Julianus, and Niger. Perhaps now we should drop the pretense. And that's about the time that Albinus got the news. In the fall of 196 CE, Severus declared his eldest son, Bassianus, as his Caesar. There we go. The seven-year-old was given the name Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Oh. Which is why it was kind of hard for me to, like, peek around the uh, yeah. dio section. Because yeah, yeah, I was yeah. calling him Bassianus, and I was like, why? what's happening? Why are you called Antoninus now? <laughs> and we'll talk about it later at a different in a different video. He doesn't go by any of these names in history. <laughs> yeah. Ah, good. Yes. These are a not the names name. here. Like not, so I'm just going to call him Bassianus throughout this episode. Okay. Because that is his name. But uh, Ridiculous. history does not know him as that. Anyway, so the seven-year-old was now the Caesar and the gloves were off. A large number of Western legions declared Albinus emperor and the second round of the civil war began. Albinus was declared a public enemy by the Senate, at Severus's insistence, of course. Mm-hmm. Probably while his gaze moved across each senator he believed had corresponded with Albinus. Ah, perfect. Declare him a public enemy. Stare. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. Uh, okay, yep, yep. Hate that guy, Albinus. That's never, right. Never talk to him, though. Don't need to. <laughs> Albinus set out with most of the British legions. He crossed into Gaul and quickly defeated Severus's legate, who, frankly, was not ready for this. Mm. He had with him around 40,000 men. Oh, God. Thus, in a matter of a couple weeks, Albinus had pushed into Europe and took the resources of one of the larger provinces of the empire. He basically was in control of Gaul now. Mm -hmm. He set his headquarters in the city of Lugdunum and waited for Severus to make his move. Lugdunum, the same city where Severus and Julia Domna had married. Severus had expected this move and did not rush out to the field. He had been away from Rome for some time and needed to get some laws passed and ensure his position was still secure. Right, right. But in January of 197 CE, he marched north with his legions. In mid-February, after a few minor victories of the Severan armies, the two main forces met outside Lugdunum. Dio tells us there were 150,000 troops on each side, which seems like a massive exaggeration. Yeah, so many people. Right. So Wikipedia puts the number around 65,000 for Severus, 55,000 for Albinus. Still huge numbers. Yeah. The historian Gibbon, who did um, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, Mm -hmm. very big historical thing, uh, asserts what I suspected while I was reading Dio. I think he was mistranslated. And meant 150,000 total. total. Yeah. Right. Because that's that's absurd. Absurd. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, huge numbers, and the fighting was intense. Each side was roughly the same in strength, and neither had superior positioning. It would be a battle of attrition and will. Both emperors were on the field that day. Oh, Severus man. had delegated for the most part in the Eastern War, but mm-hmm. here things were a lot closer to home. The numbers were more even, and as Dio puts it, it was a race for life and death. Mm-hmm. Albinus's left wing was pushed back and quickly overrun. On the right, a large portion of Albinus's men rushed forward and launched their javelins at the Severan men. It was honestly a pitiful display. The missiles landed far short of the Severan <laughs> troops. Love that. Then Albinus's men, probably fearful of their own incompetence, Oops. turned and ran. Oh. Seeing this shameful display, Severus's troops gave chase. They were soon approaching range to throw their own pilla at the backs of the fleeing cowards when suddenly the men at the front of the formation screamed and dropped into a deep trench. It's a trap! It's a trap! (laughs) Dozens inadvertently threw themselves on the spikes below. The trenches had been covered just enough Mm -hmm. that one could not see them until it was too Mm -hmm. late. The men behind stumbled into each other as the trap became known and in this confusion, the enemy reformed and launched more spears into the air. Much more accurately this I'm time. I'm sure, yeah. Thousands died in the slaughter that followed. The battle was still about even. It seemed it could go down to the last man. Severus saw his men in danger near the trenches and rushed forward with his praetorians. Then something struck him violently as he rode his trusted mount across the field. The blow was enough to knock him from his saddle. He fell onto the muddy landscape surrounded by the dead and dying. His guards were close at hand, of course, but this looked pretty bad. Severus was temporarily incapacitated. But 
He had the wherewithal to remove his imperial cloak. No need to get the enemy excited that they had felled the opposing emperor. That's right. Severus found himself lying in a ring of Praetorians as he caught his breath and regained himself. Whatever stone or missile had struck him had badly dented his breastplate, but he could breathe reasonably well, which meant he likely hadn't broken any ribs. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like the tough son bitch he was, he hoisted himself back to his feet <laughs> and drew his sword. Like, All right, cool. <laughs> he charged in as his men began fleeing. Dio claims the intent was to shame his men into returning to the fight or otherwise die with glory. Well. Huh? One of Severus's generals, Latus, not the Praetorian prefect from mm-hmm. Commodus' show because he's dead, <laughs> saw Severus rallying his men and so launched in with a swooping cavalry attack. The Albion forces, as I call mm-hmm, them in this one, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. could not stand up to this and were routed at last. It was rumored that Latus had been waiting to see who would win and then rush in and take the empire for <laughs> himself. <laughs> Whether or not this is true, he decided to save Severus that day, and it worked. It was a decisive victory. Albinus fled the field and took refuge behind the walls of Lugdunum, but it soon became clear that all was lost. Seeing no escape, he committed suicide <sighs> rather than face the wrath of Severus. And now we're here yep. from the beginning. He was right to be worried. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have mentioned that Severus has his temper and yeah. a bit of a nasty streak, and uh, you know what happens next. He's really upset. So when he with the big rock... I didn't like that at all. Yeah. (laughs) Real upset. I made you Caesar. I was going to betray you, but... Sure, but I would have left you alone. Yeah, right? You could have just stayed here and been governor, but no. So yeah, he uh, trampled the naked corpse after removing the head Mm -hmm. and sending Mm -hmm. it to Rome. The body, along with the bodies of Albinus's wife and children, were tossed into the river. That's unfortunate. It sure is. (laughs) Finally, Severus took a deep breath. After Commodus, the Empire had known nothing but instability and uncertainty for four years. Mm -hmm. Most of that time, civil war had been raging in various parts of the sprawling Empire. Severus now took stock of what was left to him. Civil wars were insanely costly in money and manpower. And like the days of Hadrian after the Jewish revolt, the legions were significantly weakened, Mm -hmm. and it would take a long time to replenish what had been lost. But as I said, Severus was a bit of an angry man. The populace had been fearful of him as he marched to Rome the first time. But now that he was finally done away with his two rivals, he let his fury be known. Oh, yay. (laughs) Yeah. The severed head of Albinus was ordered mounted on a crucifix or a pole in the city. Then Severus began declaring he was the son of Marcus and the brother of Commodus. Interesting. Yep. You already already made it. I don't know why you got to... Right. Claim this. <laughs> just, it's, yeah. It's like, just make a new dynasty, bro. It's yeah, fine. I don't it's know. totally fine. Uh, in fact, he thought loudly, why was Commodus, my brother, not deified? Senate? Excuse me? And so Commodus was deified, much right. to the chagrin of the Senate and the people. Uh-huh. A quote from Dio. While reading before the Senate a speech in which he praised the severity and cruelty of Sulla and Marius we talked about in Julius Caesar's episode, the tyrants who fought each other and almost killed Caesar. And if you don't remember, it was a very long time ago. Mm-hmm. That's okay. It's anyway, a long time ago. <laughs> and Augustus as rather the safer course and deprecated the clemency of Pompey and Caesar because it had proved their ruin. He introduced a defense of Commodus and inveined against the Senate for dishonoring him unjustly. It was just. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> but essentially what he's saying there is, uh, you know how Sulla, Marius, and Augustus just killed everyone that disagreed with them? They had the right idea. That's right. We're Pompey and Caesar in. were too soft. Move into that. Also, remember how Severus promised not to kill any senators? That's what I said. Tyrants tri- are killing senators without a trial. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that doesn't apply to traitors. You're right. You know, they, they don't, don't get need a trial. Traitors don't get s- trials. That's right. Now, obviously, Niger and Albinus had their own factions within the Senate. 29 of those believed to be in support of Albinus were executed shortly after Severus returned to the capital. The purge of 197 CE made it clear in everyone's mind just who Severus was. Now, you know, four years have passed, but no one really knew the man yet. He'd been gone. He, uh, his patients, his, his small patients ran out even more. Yeah. He was like, all right, this has been a lot. I'm upset. Mm-hmm. Not going to have it. <laughs> now that everyone knew who he was, they were very fearful and compliant. Yeah. One of the last to be executed was the General Latus. Oh. The rumors had reached Severus that uh, 
Latest might have been plotting to take the Empire, and that's not going to go. No connivers in my Empire. And so he was executed. But the people, once again, didn't need to worry for long. Severus was soon restless, and so headed back out into the field. Those damn Parthians had also helped Niger a little bit. And the first little invasion of the East had been nothing more than a show of force. That's right. Now that I'm done with this Civil War nonsense, <laughs> I can get back to Parthia. Time to make you pay. That's For right. what? My uh, annoyance. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> this, and he was going to do this despite the weakened state of the military. Yeah. Remember that the Parthian king had tried to stay out of this. He sure did. Because he knew he was too weak to put up a fight. And he was completely right about that. Uh, Severus marched east into the small province he had added in 195 CE, Mm -hmm. as Osrahin, I think is how you say that. From there, he followed the Euphrates River south and east and marched straight to the Parthian capital of Tessaphon. The advance was so quick that the city fell almost immediately. Wow. No prolonged siege. Knocked on the door. Yeah. (laughs) By late 197 CE, still the same year that Albinus rose up, (laughs) he sacked the city, slaughtered all the men, and took Upwards of 100,000 women and children as slaves. And all of their money. The royal treasury was emptied and yes. hauled back west. As in the final years of Trajan's reign, northern Mesopotamia became a province once more. Severus spent the next couple of years in the east organizing the new provinces and trying to take the city of Hatra. This is the same city Trajan had failed to take before becoming too ill to carry on. Oh. Spoilers, Severus fails to take it as well. It's a good city. Dang. Good for them. But by 198 CE, everything was looking good. Albinus and Niger were well and truly dealt with, and the succession was clear. His eldest son, Bassianus, would be next in line. In fact, Severus thought in 198 CE, why not make it super official like Marcus had done? And so he raised Bassianus from the rank of Caesar to Joint Augustus. Oh, there you go. Yep. No no question now. Which honestly, I don't think is a bad idea just in general. Right. Like, it's my kid. He's my heir. He's going to rule with me until he can rule alone. Mm-hmm. Well, what, yeah. Why have yeah. it be a different title? He's just co-Augustus. Uh-huh. Can't argue. Like, as soon Sounds as I'm dead, he's me. just a the Augustus. Yeah. Right. So after this, Severus figured he had earned himself a vacation. That's fair. He toured the eastern half of the empire, probably kind of also going, remember, I'm here. (laughs) I will kill you all if you disobey me again. Uh, He went to Egypt and Palestine for his primary visit. He saw the body of Alexander the Great and went up the Nile to see the pyramids. Hmm. Bassianus and possibly the younger son, Geta, were with him as he went. As the aging Severus and his sons traveled back to Rome in 202 CE, Severus decided it was time his heir had a wife. At the, what age? The boy was 14. There you go. So it's about time well, to start pumping out babies. Okay. I mean, it's not as young as it could be. Yeah. But it's still it's, young. Oh, you know, boy, times young. are different, but uh, yeah. The girl chosen was the daughter of a lifelong friend of Severus. The one we talked about earlier, the Praetorian prefect Gaius Fulvius Plautianus. This is the guy Severus had sent to capture Niger's kids. Mm-hmm. And this man was much like Severus in that he had quite a cruel streak. As Herodian puts it, quote, he misused this po- his power to commit all kinds of acts of cruelty and violence in everything he did, making himself one of the most feared prefects of all time. Nice. So Good best buddies with Severus, yeah, obviously. It makes sense. Plautianus' daughter, Publia Fulvia Plautilla, <laughs> seemed like a great match for young Bassianus. Though the teenage boy could not have disagreed more. Oh. From the beginning, Bassianus opposed the match. Obviously, he had no say in the marriage itself. Mm -hmm. That was going to happen. But he made clear that he would not eat nor sleep with his new wife. Full stop. Wow. Spoiled brat. In fact, he hated this match so much that he vowed to his wife and her father that when he became emperor, he would have both their heads. Oh, my God. Yeah. Just in case you were wondering if the cruelty was hereditary, it is. It is, yeah. Yeah. That's nice. The next few years passed without much to note. Severus continued rebuilding the treasury and the infrastructure damaged during the wars. Buildings were repaired and rebuilt, and Dio points out that Severus always put his name on the buildings he repaired, as if he had been the original builder. That's right. Still, things were going pretty smoothly. Until January 22nd, 205 CE, after a festival for dead ancestors, Hmm. a group of centurions approached Severus with grave news. Oh no, who has died? A man had come to them and offered them a significant amount of money 
to assassinate the two emperors. Oh, wow. That man was none other than Praetorian Prefect Plautianus. He was offered the money, or he, he offered the money? He was offering the money to have Severus. Oh, he and... was trying to get the assassin. Correct. Unfortunate. Severus was shocked and infuriated. Well, I don't think he should be that shocked. I mean... Well, but this was one of his oldest friends. His heir did just say, when I become emperor, I'm going to kill you and your daughter. <laughs> right. My wife. I don't know. So <laughs> I might have been a little flippant. He didn't say that to them. Okay. <laughs> he just said it a lot. Uh, well, yeah, it's the same <laughs> thing, really. I don't know. <laughs> okay. But Plautianus had been one of his best friends, and rumor had it that they might have been more than friends in their youth, which oh, was common. A little experimentation a there. A little, little bit of boy lover type That's thing right. in, their, in their military upbringing, perhaps. Mm. Wait, they wouldn't have been in the military no. together in, as children. Who knows? <laughs> the, uh, the one most troubled by this news was Julia Domna. Mm. Uh, her husband and children mm -hmm. were being threatened, and that would not stand. Plus, she and Plautianus were not friends. Oh. And both were always trying to gain the ear of Severus. Love that. He put great stock in their advice and each vied for more control over him, as one would. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, a wife mm -hmm. as intelligent as her wants her husband to do things that she thinks is right, and a man as powerful as Plautianus wants his emperor to do the things he wants him to do. Always going to be tension there. So... Plautianus was summoned to the Imperial Palace, where he was executed on the spot. <laughs> hey, man. I need to talk to you for a second. Come here. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. Dinner Dad. with the... Well, oh, God. Bastianus was happy to learn that this meant he could banish his young wife as well. Oh, yay. <laughs> and so he did. Uh, Plautilla was exiled to the island of Lapari. Uh, but hey, at least she wasn't beheaded. Yet. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, she's fine. She's fine. Plautianus's body was dumped in the street for mm. all to see. As he had shown before, Severus would not tolerate disloyalty. That's right. Even his highest officials and friends were not safe if he became displeased. Though some might question the authenticity of these accusations against the prefect, mm. Julia Domna and her son both despised the man, each for their own reasons. And would you look at that? Now Julia Domna was Severus's closest advisor. And Bastianus was free from a marriage he loathed. Nice. All It'll seems to out. have worked out nicely. Yeah. All worked out great. By this point, Severus's two sons were growing up. Bastianus was approaching 20, and Ghetto was just a year younger. The two did not like each other. <laughs> Naturally. At all. Good. Uh, we'll go into this a little bit more later. At all. <laughs> Imagine someone like Bastianus, who wished death upon his wife and father-in-law, being in constant squabbles with his little brother a little brother who might one day get in the way of Bastianus' succession. Yeah, a sibling rivalry to the death. Yes. Yeah. Julia Domna did what she could to keep her sons in line, but obviously they were growing up, and their rivalry was getting more and more dangerous and out of control. People in court were obviously taking sides by this point. Bastianus was co-emperor, but Ghetto was almost the same age and not quite as nasty as his brother. Mm. Both had their supporters who whispered in their ears about how bad the other one was. It seemed that this might uh, all come to a head soon. <laughs> Severus, meanwhile, was getting on in years. He was in his 60s by this point and plagued by gout and other illnesses. The infighting of his sons was likely just another annoyance in the old mm -hmm, man's mm -hmm. life. But then he got some good news. The tribes in Britain were kicking up a fuss again. Yay, time to go kill some more people. Woo! Severus jumped at the opportunity <laughs> to take his sons on a campaign and get them some proper experience. God, this man's literally like, <clears throat> I don't like government life. This is too boring. How can I get another war? I just need okay. more war. I just want more battle. <laughs> yep. So, obviously, he didn't literally jump at the opportunity. He could barely walk. But mm -hmm, he was mm -hmm. carried in a litter across Gaul to the English Channel. And he, as he was one tough son bitch... He refused to sit for too long, even when he was in horrible agony, and kept the army moving. In 208 CE, the Romans tried once again to push past Hadrian's Wall. Again, the intent was to conquer Caledonia and have complete control over this damned island. An island that had cost so much to take and hold over the last two centuries, and uh, really had no return. Yeah. So it's, why? Why are we doing this again? Well, Severus decided that this would be the end game. They well, would conquer so the whole thing. Behind that. <laughs> Shut up. No, this time it's going to work, damn it. Oh, okay. Yeah. They were going to conquer the whole thing and be done with it. 
Geta was put in charge of the civil administration of the British province and then the entire empire, essentially, while Severus and Bassianus administered the war. In 209, in fact, Geta was elevated to joint emperor. Severus now intended for both his sons got three now? to rule the empire together when he died. What a terrible plan. No, it sounds like a really good terrible idea. Plan. They get along so well. I bet they'd really collaborate <laughs> Not well. Even a little bit. Well, we'll find out, I guess. Yeah. Perhaps the hope was that this would put an end to their bickering. Right. Regardless, <laughs> the war went on for the next couple of years. Severus and Bassianus saw decent success and got a few peace treaties with several local tribes. But Severus's health was rapidly deteriorating. He was so unwell that he could not run the war personally. Instead, he delegated to his son, who, frankly, didn't care much about this war. <laughs> it was clear that Bassianus saw this expedition as an opportunity to gain favor with the army and nothing mm. more. Well, I mean, sure. It's, an it's a stupid war. It is a stupid <laughs> war. In fact, Bassianus was growing frustrated with the fact that his father just wouldn't die. <laughs> it's all right, old man. <laughs> Rumor had it that Bassianus uh, had even was even talking to Severus's doctors about, you know, maybe not treating him just properly or you know, who him. knows, don't feed him. Let's I don't just know. Just euthanize the man. It's fine. Yeah. Then, one day, on one of the rare occasions that Severus was well enough to ride out with the men because he needed to go meet mm -hmm. with a delegation of Caledonians, panicked shouts went up in the air. Several troops had noticed that Bassianus was drawing his sword oh. behind his father's back. Oh! As Severus noticed his son, Bassianus d diverted. Uh, <laughs> uh, point, you know, just, just in the open. Just points just the sword drawing. like, yeah, birds. Um, yeah, we'll go that there. way. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or uh, hi, Dad, and puts the sword back in the sheath. Just in public. Yep. Just... Severus uh, <laughs> made no apparent response. Just <laughs> carried on. Uh, got the peace treaty signed that he was going to do, and then went back to his tent. Wild. That night, however, he summoned Bassianus to his quarters. Mm -hmm. and there, the young man found his ailing father and the current Praetorian prefect. Ah. What do you think happened? Uh, Severus was like, hey, man, if you want to stab me, you can just stab me. It's fine. You can take over. I'm tired. Wow. Spot on. <laughs> Spot on. Severus calmly explained that his son had better never do that yeah. again <laughs> in front of everyone. Ah, there you go. A sword <laughs> sat on the desk in front of him. Ah. And he said, how about you go ahead and cut me down? You're young and strong. I'm old and frail. You're the co-emperor. And if you're too much of a bitch to do it, tell the prefect to do it. I won't countermand the order. Got him. The balls on this man. Absolute balls. <laughs> It was kind of foolish, though, considering um, the stupid, brazen thing his son had just done, and yet he goes, oh, yeah, no, why don't you go ahead and kill me and be emperor? Mm-hmm. Instead of making him not heir. No, 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 double down. Yeah, double down for sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he had already been saying that he hates his brother and would, like, kill him given the chance. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe unchecked power is what this guy needs when Severus dies. Yeah, I well, think so. Bastianus backed down. Keeps, what a like, bitch. I know. He's like, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Dad. <laughs> I didn't mean to try and murder you in front of everybody. I'll, I'll be a good boy. That's my bad. <laughs> he, he decided he would wait for his time to be emperor. Fortunately for him, he didn't need to wait long. Huh. On February 4th, 211 CE, Severus died in the city that would one day become York. He was 65 years old. Dang. Yeah. So what do you think of Severus? I don't know. Just just a crotchety man. Yeah, grumpy just, guy. Yeah. Very grumpy. Uh, very vicious, but also, like, does his job yeah, well. Yeah, he was probably a fine administrator. Yeah. Probably ran things well, mm -hmm. but just, yeah, had a temper. Would yeah. have been great to be, like, someone in power under a better emperor. Right. Yeah. Uh, just a general. Yeah. Like, had him as like, a general under Marcus yeah, or something. You get the things done. You will love war. So, yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of that, <laughs> mastery of military might. So, between 193 and 197 CE, so four years, he fought and won a civil war in the East. He conquered a small province and cleaned up those small kingdoms who had aided Niger's claim to the purple. Mm -hmm. He fought a second civil war in the western half of the empire, also a victory. And then he headed back to the east to sack Tessaphon and defeat their ancient enemies, the Parthians. 
He then fought a campaign in Africa in 202 CE to solidify the southern border. I couldn't find much information on that, so it was probably pretty quick. Finally, he went to Britain in 208 CE to put an end to all the trouble the place had caused, and he had considerable success. But unfortunately, he died before completing the conquest of Caledonia. During his time fighting Niger's followers, Dio tells us of one excursion, quote, When he had crossed the Euphrates and invaded hostile territory, where the country was destitute of water and at this summer season had become especially parched, he came dangerously near losing great numbers of soldiers. He goes on to say that Severus stuck with his men, and when they found water, he personally reinvigorated them Hmm. by showing them that they could carry on and he was with them. Um, Other stories tell us how he had endured hardships with his men to keep their morale up, including in the British Mm -hmm. and... um, Albinan, the Albion Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. campaigns. A a good quality in a leader, for sure. Dio, interestingly, also points out that expanding lands closer to Parthia was foolish, which is what he did. He added new provinces. Mm -hmm. The mindset of enough is enough seems to have been well-rooted at this point. And, I mean, it makes sense because each expansion since Augustus had caused nothing but headaches. Like Yeah, just the unnecessary push. Like We have a lot. Let's just use it and prosper. Natural borders are great. Yeah. If Severus was not there leading his men personally, he was leading them through experienced men to whom he issued commands. So if he wasn't at the front, he mm-hmm. was still delegating, still in charge. So that's, I mean, two civil wars against almost equally matched opponents. Mm-hmm. He used mm-hmm. guile. Um, he used skill. He used his legions effectively. Then invading the biggest... external threat to Rome, even though they're at a weakened state, Parthia. Whooped them so fast that in under a year, he sacked their capital. Yeah. Basically paid for the civil war through the treasury. Yeah. And then when he felt like it, went up to Britain, had a lot of success, and then he died. I don't know, man. It's pretty good. I'm going to give him a nine. Yeah. I'm going to give him a nine because he did, because even though he's very good at war, he chose to do stupid wars. Chose to do stupid wars. Yeah. Just like try to expand past the borders for no reason. Mm. It was dumb. There's no reason for it. Is that uh is that mastery of military might or is that like lives of the living though? No, master of military might. You're killing your men. Even though you're having more success, you are still taking losses and costing money. Suppose. For no I would reason. say the only one I would say that it was kind of unnecessary, the extent would be Britain. Yeah. I mean, Parthia, it wasn't necessary, but it was a it was a net positive for sure. Yeah, that one worked out well. Yeah, that was fine because they okay. were so weak. Well, if you're gonna give him a nine, because mm-hmm. I was worried about having too many perfects here. We have a few: Marcus, uh, Trajan, Vespasian, who I still think we gave a little too high on his, <laughs> and not Julius Caesar. Um, I so you give him a nine. I think I want to give him a ten, or do I just give him a nine? He was really good. I'm going to give him a 10. And you Do give him it. a 9. So yep. that is a, a 19. Terrible tyranny. A quote from the Historia Augusta. During his legate ship, when he was walking along preceded by the fasces, which are some important sticks that you hold in uh, the Senate so that you can talk. Ah, oh, the talking stick. Correct. I like that. One of his fellow townsmen embraced him as an old comrade. Severus gave the man a beating with cudgels yes. while his herald <laughs> proclaimed, let no plebeian embrace a legate of the Roman people with impunity. <laughs> yeah. He's always, <laughs> always had a bit of a nasty streak to him. Okay. So more seriously, he marched an army on Rome for the express purpose of making himself emperor. Sure. Avenge Pertinax and all, but yeah. uh, this was a power play through and through. Uh-huh. Before declaring Bassianus as heir, he contemplated having Albinus assassinated. According to Herodian, the plan was either to get Albinus alone with these messengers, where they would then slaughter him, or someone would poison him. Whatever works. Didn't end up happening, though. Yeah, it would have been better. Yep. Despite his guarantee to that no senators would be killed without a fair trial, he executed nearly 30 senators after his civil wars. No, 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 no. They were no longer senators. They were traitors. They were traitors. Right. Many, many others were also killed in those wars um, to revenge himself upon them. 100%. Yeah. Severus's close friend and prefect, Plautianus, was executed because he was accused of plotting regicide. 
this is something that might have been found to be false if the man had been given a chance to defend himself. Instead, he was executed on the spot. Mm -hmm. The treatment of Albinus's corpse and his family is also pretty terrible. Oh, yeah. That's just downright cruelty, if it happened, you know, but we'll say it did. Uh, as was the enslavement of 100,000 Parthians. I mean, that is terrible, but it is warfare at the time. He literally ripped cities apart and stripped them of their positions in government as reprisal for their support of Niger. Yes. Out of spite. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just out of spite is exactly uh -huh. it. He knew his son and heir was a violent, angry little shit, mm -hmm. but he kept him on as heir. Yeah. This despite his frequent mention that Marcus should have killed Commodus and named a new heir. Obviously, he said this before declaring that he was the son of Marcus and brother of Commodus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those that's that's pretty much it. I mean, pretty mm. terrible. Um, not not full out like yeah, it's not like full psycho. Not a, yeah, it's it, there's a not an excuse but a reason sure. for his his terrible acts. Sure. Um, so he's not a perfect ten by any means. No. But I'm thinking somewhere like a. Seven? Yeah, eight? I was thinking six or seven. Yeah. But I think I can go to seven. Because mm -hmm. he, he did just look for war. He looked for reasons to, to kill people. Yeah. He looked for the reason. And then he was very spiteful in his further like punishment. Right, these. yes. It's just like unnecessary. I'm just going to break all your things and right. kill you. Oh, and obviously the people that were executed, the wealth went to him. Yes. Prescriptions and all that. Uh -huh. you know, of course. So... So you think seven? So Julianus got uh, fourteen, seven and seven. Okay. You think he's on par with Severus? You think I can remember all the specifics of these people? Didius Julianus is the one that bought the empire. Yeah, sure. All right, cool. I think seven is fair. Yeah, so that'd be a fourteen for terrible tyranny. Ah, does it need to be? I'm gonna give him an eight. We'll give we'll give him a fifteen. Okay. I think that I think that makes more sense. He was a bad boy. He was a bad boy. Lives of the living. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the cons on this one first, just because it's. Uh, I think it, I think it fits better. So an army marching on Rome and forcefully removing another emperor is never great for the people, right? Although in this instance, it was for the better. Two civil wars are also very scary and expensive, and cost many, many, many lives, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all of your own people. The Senate were terrified of the man because he expected complete loyalty and can turn to anger and violence at the drop of a hat. Now, the pros. A new dynasty is now in place, and mm -hmm. the stable transfer of government is assured. I guess. Right. No more murder and fighting to name the next emperor. Yeah. We have two. We're yeah. good. Once the wars were, you seem dubious uh -huh. or skeptical. Yeah. No, it just sounds good on paper. It sure does. Yeah. That yeah. Well, we'll just have to see what happens next time. Once the wars were over, the empire began to prosper once again. The corruption in government was steadily stripped away, mainly by the deaths of those doing all the bad stuff. Right. The economy recovered, and the might of the military arms was reaffirmed, which is always a big boost to the people. The soldiers also loved him because he gave them massive pay mm -hmm. raise. Mm -hmm. Things were much better than they had been for the last couple of decades. Dio tells us that he was a tireless worker and did much for the administration of government. So, on the whole, things are much better. Mm -hmm. But where where do you put that, you know? <laughs> I love that. So, for context, Commodus got a three total. Yeah, no. Didius Julianus got a zero. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Things are better now. They are. Um, despite... Some of the other problems, um, things are significantly better. Yeah, but I wouldn't correct, and I wouldn't blame. At least I wouldn't. I wouldn't blame at least the second civil war on him. Directly. Yeah, and the first. Yeah, I think I think both parts of the civil war are really the fault of everyone with armies. Right. Yeah. Um, and really, you could lay the blame at the feet of. Julianus and the Praetorians because mm -hmm. that's why it happened. But yeah, I mean, it wasn't really his fault. Just he was one of the ones yeah. that went, I'm going to go for it. There was a vacuum and he, uh, he stepped in it. Yep. 
So, ah, man. <laughs> so under Marcus, it was a 14 because everything was going to shit and he was doing his best. Right. I think we're around there again. Six or seven because things are improving. But civil wars are really bad. Mm-hmm. 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 I think I'll mm-hmm. give him a six. Yeah, I was hovering around a five or a six, too, but a six makes more sense. Yeah, I think so. I was on a six or seven, but I feel like seven's too good. Right, yeah. yeah. If he Maybe if he lived longer and then had concluded all of the wars yeah. within his reign. And I think, I don't think I mentioned it. Uh, let's see, so 193 to 211, so about 17, 18 years was mm-hmm. his reign. So he was there for a bit, but you're right. He kind of left it unfinished because he died. Right. So are you going for a six? Yeah. So that is 12 for Lives of the Living. He's doing pretty well. Departing demise. Severus was engaged in the fighting in Britain, as we just saw. They had been there for over two years by this point, and his gout was at its all-time worst. That, and then to make matters worse, he began feeling ill. Love that. Fearing that his time was near, he ordered an ornate jar be brought to Britain. It was a beautiful thing made of purple pottery. When he held it in his hands, he said, Thou shalt hold a man that the world could not hold. (laughs) Burn my body and put it in here. (laughs) Correct. Shortly after this, the illness gripped him. Dio tells us that as his body began to fail, his intellectual mind remained sharp. Hmm. On February 4th, 211 CE, Severus summoned his sons, which is a hard thing to say, to (laughs) his bedside. He left them with these parting words. Be harmonious. Enrich the soldiers, scorn everybody else. Don't kill each other, keep the swords happy. (laughs) Fuck everyone. Yeah, that's right. Yes. (laughs) And then he died. What great words. His body was placed on a pyre surrounded by his soldiers and sons. A great display was put on as the men tossed special items onto the pile before the emperor, before the two new emperors Mm. set it ablaze. The two then put the ashes of their father into the purple urn. And we will pick up the rest of that story next time. Wonderful. So that is Severus's death. Nothing super exciting. Yeah. A couple fun quotes. Yeah. Kind of unfortunate timing. A peaceful death. Uh, four? Three? I was going to say four. Yeah. Because he did have that little stare down with with his other son. A little, st- little before that happened. Oh, yeah. A little yeah, before he died. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. Okay. So a four and a four. Yeah. I'll go three just so our numbers look different sometimes. <laughs> All right. So that is a seven for Departing Demise, which I think is fair. Lasting Legacy. So he is considered the first provincial governor as he was the first emperor not only born in the provinces, but also into a provincial family of mm. non-Italian origin. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's the first emperor from Africa. Mm-hmm. It is a common myth because of this that he is the first black emperor. There were no black emperors, unfortunately. Yeah, I was like that. I mean, I guess I get the logic, but if you think a, just a, two more seconds logically, that was a province of the emperor or empire. I'm sure right. a and lot of people lived there or moved there. Right. It, you know, it's simple ignorance of people thinking that every human being born in the African continent has yeah. ebony skin. Right. You know, Egyptians aren't black. Oh, correct. <laughs> you know, a lot of South Africa. Well, yeah, that that came later, but yes. Correct. That was all colonization. (laughs) Colonization, for sure. But the point remains... idea, honestly. Yeah. Really. (laughs) Yes. Well, yes, you are are correct. Obviously, there were people of various skin tones across the empire, Mm -hmm. but Severus was definitely not black. He was your typical Mediterranean skin tone person. Yeah. Um, But he was the first emperor born in Africa, Mm -hmm. which is something. Uh, He added a couple of provinces to the empire and joined the prestigious club of Roman emperors who have sacked Tessaphon. Ah, very great. Good pastime. (laughs) He disbanded the Praetorians and uh, only to essentially recreate them with his own troops. Mm -hmm. Still a very pivotal moment in Roman history after centuries of the guards being a bit dodgy. Yeah. He raised soldier pay significantly, like doubled it. Perfect. This is a trend that would carry on and is definitely going to be a problem as we are, you know, running out of money. Well, we're in the uh, third century right now. Yeah. And that's when the crisis starts. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Yeah. So not good. He also changed the rules to allow troops to serve where they lived. Oh. This meant that, like, for example, German legions were made up of German people. Mm -hmm. So they stayed in the provinces where they were born with their families. 
That seems good. This is great for individual soldiers. Right. But when you need to march troops all over the empire for revolts mm-hmm. and wars, yeah, yeah, yeah. they start getting kind of complacent. Yeah. And they don't want to leave their families. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. So this is also the beginning of the Severan dynasty. And we will be talking about this family for a while. So big, big ups to him. Their impact on Roman history is significant. Um, Let's see. He also won the year of the five emperors, which isn't as accurate as the year of the four emperors. Because there were really three emperors and two right. usurpers who lost. Yeah. but And it lasted four years. Mm-hmm. So they just, uh, they really like the naming close convention. Enough. Right. close enough. Right. <laughs> so, um, Yeah. Lasting legacy, pretty pretty significant. Um, obviously, he's not as well remembered. His oh, his uh, name is probably the inspiration of Severus Snape. Either that, or J.K. Rowling just really liked Latin and knew that Severus meant stern. Stern, yeah. yeah. So I think he's pretty important, but not super. Right. I've never heard of the man. Right. Yeah. Well, that's probably true for everyone. For a while now. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. There's probably two or three more that you've heard the name of. I don't know. Let's give him a seven. I think a seven? Yeah. Yeah. Seems pretty significant. He he definitely is. I can go with that. So that is a 14 for lasting legacy. He's got a pretty good score. He sure does. You want to take a gander or a guess at uh, at his score? Within the top three. No. Dang. No. I can't remember that far back. Yes. Within the top five. How many have we done? <laughs> we are. This is 12. Oh. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, the odds are pretty good then. <laughs> yeah, he is. Let's see. So he tied with Caligula. Okay. So 67. So what's and our max again? What are like, what, what's the highest? Julius Caesar has 85.5. Oh, well. Yeah. And then, yeah, it it ranges. The lowest is thirty nine. Right. Yeah. No. He. Yeah. That, he needed that. Mm-hmm. So, not bad. Pretty good. Yeah. Where did he Where did he miss out on? His, Lives of the Living was a little lower than some of the better guys. And which other one? Um. um Departing the, demise. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. Was pretty low the as demise. well. But still pretty good. So now we just have two things left to discuss. The great. <sighs> Yeah, you're making the noise that I was. Yeah, right. Making. You're like you. You're like no, but uh, he mm. did. This is the great, though. I know. You know, so it's uh, no, no. I think I no don't. too. I don't think I would make a golden bust out of him to forever be remembered. Right in the he's halls really of history. But sure, not... he's interesting, but I wouldn't give him the great. Yeah. 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 I think so. I think being just a dick kind of ruined it because he's basically but Vespasian. Yeah. yeah. No, he just like purposely. Yeah. Just wanted violence. <laughs> He's just, like, woke nah. up and wanted violence. It woke up and chose violence every day. Yep. Well, okay. So that is a no for the great, but that doesn't mean we're not going to give him his epithets. So I got a few. Um, so Severus the African just seems like a boring. simple one. It's boring. <laughs> Severus the irritable. <laughs> Severus the cantankerous, which basically means irritable and, oh, and kind of douchey. Right, just pick up the Thothorus. The Thothorus. <laughs> the Thothorus. The Thothorus. Uh, the Conqueror, the Nasty, the Short-Tempered. I don't know, man. I I thought of Ill-Tempered. Yeah, the Ill-Tempered. When it came to me, yeah, yeah, when he said that. That is basically what cantankerous means. Yeah, well, that just sounds dumb. <laughs> sounds dumb. <laughs> sounds pretentious, you know? Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so the, the Ill-Tempered? Yeah, I don't think he deserves any other... Or the short that of... Yeah, it needs to be about... Is temper right because he doesn't deserve like the conqueror or something? Yeah, I agree. Mm. The severe, sure, yeah. Severus the severe yeah. that actually fits really yeah, well. That works, yeah. <laughs> All right, Severus the severe, perfect. Well, no clapping or applauding for him, but I interesting, interesting, interesting for sure. Yeah, and I for one just feel so bad for what's about to happen. I think. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a really good episode, though. Seems seems like it's probably not going to go great. Yeah, so for anyone who listens to the very end, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. If anyone knows this <gasps> name, what uh, what his son is called is Caracalla. Caracalla? 
And that is who we'll be discussing next week. God, this man just changes his name all the time. They all do. <laughs> I they know. All do. It's wild. You have to just, it's, it is very hard sometimes to like go, who are you talking about? Yeah. In these ancient like, sources. You have a name, just right. use it, please. <laughs> it's, it's crazy that um, despite that, many of the ancient sources, and I don't know if this is a translation thing mm-hmm. where the modern translation just made it Caracalla or mm-hmm. if they called him Caracalla. Not sure. But he is uh, very interesting. Well, and he's going to be emperor along be with something. his brother Geta. For who, how long? Who knows? We shall see. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. Um, I don't have anything else really. It's mm. been a good time. Yeah. I just realized I never uploaded a, a video version of the last episode how because dare you? Because we uh, we made it and then I left. That's true. You edited it and just like, I was gone. Kicked for it out. Two yeah. weeks. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good one. Okay. Bye.